Hello, Wendy. How, how you doing? I'm awesome. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. Yay. Sound okay. Also, thank you so very much for this. Um, I have a lot of people that are looking forward towards this conversation that we're about to have. You know what I mean? So it's, I've, I've been a fan of yours for, for a lot of years. Um, and I think you said a lot of... Hold on, hold on one second. I need to put something on. You s oh. Yeah, you said a, a lot of templates for us in my industry over the last couple of years um, and a couple of things that we're going to discuss is going to be extremely important to people within my community and as well as a lot of people I know within my space because to me success always has a trail no matter what it is it you know so yep. there's nothing new underneath the sun <laughs> you sure. can always trace everything back to something else you know so again you guys welcome um, I'm still I'm still spotlight and I'm with the awesome gifted um lady wendy day um from the hip-hop world a lot of people know her some of you that don't know you need to go and read a book you need to go pick up a book seriously you know you've trailblazed a lot of stuff within the hip-hop industry and helped make a lot of independent artists know that they can do this by themselves without having to sign up to a major label and i think the main reason why i also wanted to speak to you is that's what you stood for for like a long time helping right. the independent artists be able to stand on their feet you know so um, I, can't, I know I can't do you know a proper introduction, but again, please, I'll let you introduce yourself, Wendy Day, and let people know who you are. And yeah, literally, I will get started. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, my name is Wendy Day. Um, I do three things in the music business. Um, the first one is the not-for-profit rap coalition. So when an artist is in a bad deal or they've gotten shelved by their major label, we step in and we help negotiate them out of that deal. And we don't charge for that. That's a free service that we offer. Um, the for-profit side of what I do is called Power Moves. And mm. Power Moves is for artists that have investors and um, want to either create an independent career or they mm -hmm. want to start their own independent record label. And they bring me on in the U.S. They bring me on to help structure, organize, and set up their label or their career or their company and then teach them how to make money with their music. And then the last thing I do is, is kind of what you do right here where I teach folks about the music industry. And I'm setting up a website now to help educate artists, both artists that are part of the major label system and artists that are independent, basically teaching them, myself and my friends, we've gotten together and we're teaching them how to make money with their music. And that should launch probably in, in the next three to four months, hopefully. Oh. Oh, great stuff. Oh, you're, you're being busy. So you guys, I see you guys are just coming in. Um, I, if you guys can hear us okay, please give a thumbs up. I want to see a lot of hot emojis kind of go in um, so that um, whatever questions I actually do also have, put it in the question box. We're going to be taking a couple of questions. I actually want this to be as an interactive session as possible because one thing I know when this stands for is passing on knowledge and information and value as much as she can. So ask whatever question you guys need to ask because right now she's going to drop a lot of Valuable information for you guys that I think you guys can learn from, you know. So, Wendy, how did you actually get into the music industry? And how many years have you been in the uh, music industry now for? 29. 29 years. 29 years, yeah. Ooh. Most of you have been alive. So, <laughs> yeah. I, started, I, I came to music as a fan. I started listening to rap in 1980 when it first started. And I just love the energy and the passion of the music. And I love the culture of hip hop. So I came to this through the culture, the music, and just really loving it. In 1992, I realized so many artists were being taken advantage of by the music industry that I started Rap Coalition. So I started the company as 
um, as a way to help artists that weren't receiving the help that they need they needed from the industry. Oh wow! And yes. that was Rap Coalition. Yeah. So I, Rap Coalition is um it's a charity, isn't it? Right, the non profit yes. organization. Yes. Power Moves is not, but Rap Coalition is. And I'm better known for Rap Coalition because that's my heart. Like, that's my mission, is to help artists. And then I realized um, about four years in, I realized that just pulling people out of bad deals wasn't enough. Yeah, that yeah. If artists had leverage, they wouldn't get into a bad deal to begin with. So I got really proactive. I started Power Moves, and we started consulting and educating artists on how not to get jerked by the music industry. So mm -hmm. that's really as much as I love pulling people out of bad deals because they need the help. I'd rather be proactive than reactive mm -hmm. and help yeah. people get into a situation where they don't get taken advantage of. Awesome. I think you've made a lot of two key points there. Um, the intention of what you're trying to do as well as the education as well of why you need to also be educated as an artist because if you take somebody out of a bad deal that doesn't stop them from going into another bad deal and all you're doing is bringing them out of different bad deals without them being educated about how to prevent themselves and they're not able to create a legacy kind of moving forward exactly because obviously you want people to be in good situations and i noticed with the deals that i was pulling people out of they weren't always the labels that, that were taking advantage of the artists weren't always doing it on purpose. Sometimes it just kind of happened. Either they signed another artist who grew bigger faster and they forgot about the smaller artist, or they the, the label guy that brought that artist in got fired or left for another job, and then the artist was just left sitting still. So in being proactive, it was kind of helping everybody. Cause I don't believe that a major label is in the business of really trying to screw over artists. I think they make money when the artist makes money. Oh, actually funny. I like that thought because in today's industry, especially in my industry, cause I'm from the African Afrobeat industry. Um, a lot of artists want to go independent now and you have this conflicting thoughts of, should I get signed or should I stay independent? And you have, some individuals say, listen, labels are here and the devil, don't you ever get signed and never get signed and stay independent. While other people are saying, listen, if you don't have the leverage, neither do you have the resources or infrastructure, right. then what is your opinion on artists trying to stay independent or getting signed? What are the, what are the benefits of each one and I what would you advise? Absolutely. I can't give you like an, like, I can't say this is good for everybody because everybody's different. If you're an artist that has no hustle and no mm. entrepreneurial bent Spirit. whatsoever, <laughs> you should not be an independent artist. You're going to fail. You need somebody that can actually help promote you and catapult you out there. So getting signed or staying independent isn't just overall terms for everybody. You know, um, I don't think we'd have a break today if he was independent. I don't know that you could build an artist to be that large in urban music in mm. the U.S. staying independent. You know, maybe you can. I just don't know. I don't have, I don't have the the um, the foresight to know that. You know, I think a major label can get artists um, onto like the Grammy Awards. You know, giving away awards and get them onto different television shows in the US like Jimmy Kimmel where they can reach millions of people. There's certain things that major labels do really well. What they don't do very well, really in my opinion, is break new artists. So if you're a new artist and you can afford to market and promote yourself, your best opportunity is to build enough of a buzz to get to a point where you have a choice of whether mm. they independent or signed to a major label. I've done a lot of major label deals for artists that I've worked with, and I don't regret any of them because mm. the deal was so spectacular mm -hmm. that it catapulted the artist 
to not just fame, but also to making money. You know, Lil Wayne, Eminem, um, everybody on No Limit, everybody on Cash Money, David Banner, like people have done really well as part of the major label system. And then once they get to a point where they're, they're either um, through with that system and they want to come back independent the way Joyner Lucas did or the way mm -hmm. David Banner did, that makes perfect sense to me because they're back making the lion's share of the money. Also, no, I think, no, that's, I think, again, you get a very balanced view. Again, some people don't have the leverage, while some people do, but it, it comes down to what is the, what is the agreement that you're actually signing and how, what level of leverage do you actually have going into any contractual I agreement? Said that because somebody in the in the um, in the feed just said, "Oh, we have over a million streams on YouTube, and that's just not enough." Like you might <laughs> think your leverage is strong and you're ready to get a deal, but the reality is you're competing with everybody else around the world. So you may have, um, let's say, you have 10 million views on YouTube, but there's 20 other people that have 100 million views. Mm -hmm. And you're competing with the leverage. So what you think is wonderful may not be. I, I'm working with an artist right now, and he is streaming, just streaming income. He's streaming between $30,000 US and $50,000 US a month. A month, Ooh, right? A month. And, yeah, a month. And he said to me, you know, um, can you just go out and see, like, what types of deals – from the majors would be available to me. Like, let's, let's just see what else is out there. And as I started talking to labels and they started looking in, they were like, okay, yeah, he's doing great independently, but we don't feel like putting our, our, um, uh, behind him behind him would make it so that he'd be making a hundred thousand a month. We just don't see that. So while they thought it was great that he was doing that, and that is amazing leverage for anybody, the major labels that I spoke to just didn't feel that they could get him much further than he was already doing on his own. Meaning the deal that they would have to offer him would not necessarily be beneficial to him. Oh, Great. Um, I think one thing that a couple of friends, um, there's a friend of mine, Tai Yemi Alade, uh, the manager, is a well-known artist from the Afrobeat scene. I um, asked him to ask you this question. <laughs> I said, I promised I was going to ask you. Everybody knows you, particularly from the landmark um, situation that you helped cash money and also no limits kind of get into. How, how were you able to, what was that deal like and how were you able to break such a very landmark type situation because I think that helped a lot of independent labels you know that they could go in, stay yeah. independent, make money, and yeah. keep the money. What was that deal exactly like? And how how did I even come to your mindset that you know we can structure such a deal that it will benefit the label as well as still benefit the, the, the independent um label or artists? Well all of the deals that I've ever done have benefited both sides because it's not a good deal if if you and I enter into a business together and I'm making money and you're not, that's not a good deal for you. Really? You're making money and I'm not, that's not a good deal for me. So a good deal is where everybody makes money and we all grow together, right? So all of the deals that I've done have been good deals because it's important for everybody to win. Cash Money was 23 years ago. Um, no Limit was 27 or 28 years ago. So... It, it's not today's music industry. It's something that occurred because these guys were selling a lot of music independently. For example, yeah. Cash Money, they had put out 31 albums over a six-year period. Now understand, this is over two decades ago. We don't really put out albums anymore. With streaming, we put out bodies of work we put yeah. out singles we put out songs we put out content we don't really drop albums the way we did in the 1990s so it's a little bit different today but all that to say if i'm going to equate it to today's success yeah. they were able to build enough of a fan base 
for all of their artists to remove the risk from the major label mm -hmm. so that when the label looked in at what they were doing, they said, wow, if we put our machine behind what these guys are doing, we can exponentially help them explode and make more money. And that's what they did. And I knew going in what these guys could do because when, when I came along in August of 1997 i saw what they were doing but i also saw some weak spots in their plans like for example their biggest album was bg chopper city in the ghetto and mm -hmm. they only worked that for six weeks and it was at twenty five thousand sales but i what? knew that it could do much more so when i came on board i looked at their system and their operations and I saw that they were dropping too much music too quickly. So I slowed them down a little bit. And I saw that they were only dropping in New Orleans and Houston. So their, their target market was very yeah. limited. But their fan was spreading all the way to um, Jacksonville, Florida, up into Jackson, Mississippi, over into Los Angeles. But they weren't really capitalizing on that fan base they were really just focused mm -hmm. on their their own territory so um the attorneys that were helping me do the deal were also the attorneys for three six mafia so we put cash money out on tour to open for three six mafia and we brought them up into the mid-south and the midwest so and and the southeast so that they were able to really reach a bigger fan base. So when we put out the the next, when they put out their first album with me helping them, we did 75,000 copies and sales on that album in, I, I wanna say it was two months or, or a month. I mean, it was so fast. And that's what Universal saw. That was, and not just Universal, we were, it was a bidding war. So that's what everybody saw. They saw the fact that these guys could really get to the next level quickly and that there was a huge fan base that wanted their music. It would be the equivalent today of going viral on TikTok or Instagram 50 or 60 times in a row. Wow. That so, would be so when you think about that like we think about stuff that goes viral and we go wow that's really cool but imagine that same person doing it again and again, again and again i mean that's an easy business model when you see that somebody can do something more than once more than twice more than times that's a no-brainer and that's why they got a 30 million dollar deal because it was just so friggin' obvious that they could do this again and they were able to keep their, they were able to keep their masters while they, it was their stuff was distributed, right? I, I think what you said right there, you said some very key things. You didn't just go into that situation just saying we're just talented or we're just good enough, but you were able to show the numbers, and you're also intentional in going to certain regions also to be able to show their reach and they have fan bases out of their local like market. And what yeah. I always talk about is as well is especially in today's age where everything is digital. Once you put out music, your music is not localized. Anymore. It's actually international. So what else are you doing to make sure you're reaching those fans in Japan? You're reaching those fans in the States. You're reaching those fans in, you know, in Germany. Like, what is your intention? Are you and, just going to, yeah. And, and what are you doing to stand out? Like, you're, you're, what you're saying is so on point. But if we're looking at just Spotify alone, which is only one platform, mm -hmm. right? in the U.S., it, Spotify is putting out, 40, I think it's 40,000 releases a week. Yeah. So if yeah. there's 40, if there's 39,999 other artists mm -hmm. dropping on the same day as you, how are you standing out from them? Mm -hmm. Talent is not enough. Just being, you can be the most talented person stuck in your own house. You know, mm -hmm. how, are you, how do you get from your house to, you know, my ears, your ears, everybody's ears in the world. And it's the marketing and the promotion that mm -hmm. takes the talent to the next level. It's almost more important than the talent. And I hate to say that because that kind of leads to mediocre music, but that's what, that's what catapults music around is mm -hmm. when fans really like it. And in order for them to like it, they have to hear it. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I think you've said a, 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 pro, a real important, um, I, there's this film I watched one time and it was like, build it and it shall come. I think a lot of artists feel that because my music is good, if I create it, people will listen and it will just get to wherever it needs to get to. But again, oh no fault is put into the promotion and the marketing of that setting track. And I've always said, if a blockbuster movie comes out today, when Avengers Endgames came out, with the 101 different superstars that were on there, the promotion and marketing was nearly as much as the budget of the film. Correct. So you can't just create this awesome product and let nobody see it. Correct. So what is, what is, what is your advice in, on artists putting out what they consider to be a great body of work, it be a single or an album, and how should they go about planning or marketing or promotional strategy for getting as much, obviously, you know, as much exposure for that um, content as, as much as we can. The way I'm going to explain the way that I do it, but I want to preface this by saying the music has to be great. It can't just be good. And by great, I don't mean that I think my own music is great. I mean, other people are really excited about my music. And when they hear it, they share it with their friends. That's what I mean by great. Because our goal is to spread this word of mouth as as far and wide as we can. But the way that I do it is I focus on a small territory. So here in the US, I'll draw a circle around wherever the artist is based. So let's say the artist is based in Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I am today. So I'm going to draw a circle on a map around Atlanta and I'm going to draw a circle of about a five-hour driving radius because that's something that I can comfortably cover. So I can drive five hours in every direction, and that's who I want to reach with my market. I can afford to reach that market. I can drive it in my car. If I had to do a show on Friday night in in the furthest market to the east, I could get on Saturday night to do a show to the furthest market in the west. So... It's, mm. it, it's feasible for me to market and promote this in this area. And then once I have that, that area on, on my map figured out, I'm going to go hard on the internet. I'm going to do digital yeah. ads. I'm going to do Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do um, an influencer marketing campaign mm -hmm. on TikTok. Mm -hmm. If the music is right for TikTok, I'm going to mm -hmm. do an influencer marketing campaign on Instagram. Um, reaching my target market. I'm going to focus just on the people that I want to reach most. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also going to go out into the real world. So I'm mm -hmm. going to drive to every good sized city and town in that circle on my map. And I'm going to, uh, this is obviously not during COVID, right? But I'm going to pass out flyers that have all of my links on it. I'm going to perform as much as possible. I'm going to hit mm. every high school, every college campus. I'm going to hit every hood. I'm going to hang posters. I'm going to meet people and take pictures with them and post them on my social media. I'm going to make mm. it look like I'm larger than life. Okay. And okay. like I'm on tour, like I'm fucking Drake or Rihanna. I'm going to look bigger than life. And I'm going to just keep doing that as much as I possibly can. You know, I posted this picture that I found this morning right before we got on live today. Um, somebody posted a picture of Travis Scott from 2014 and then right below it is a picture of Travis Scott from 2019 and yeah. both pictures are standing behind him on a stage and in 2014 there's maybe 30 people in the audience mm -hmm. in 2019 it's like fucking Wimbledon like there mm -hmm. are just tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people and the difference is five years and, and what Travis Scott did in that five-year period was he marketed, he promoted, he went out on tours, he, he, he had the budget to, to get people to buy into his franchise and to see who he is, check out his music. The ones that liked it stayed. The ones that didn't kept it moving. Oh, I think that's key because, again, it's about finding those your super fans, those advocates for your brand and advocate for your music. Because those, yeah. those are the people that are now going to tell a hundred other people about your music. And I think even back then, it was also so much harder than it is now. So though your music is also being exposed to so much more people, but you can connect with so much more people worldwide with your music. But yeah. 
Again, you have to be intentional. Yeah. You can't be reactive. You have to be more proactive yeah. in how you're marketing and how you're promoting. It. You have to be a sniper, not a shotgun. Oh, I love that saying when you kind of put that up. I, I want to come back into, there's a conversation I read um, online when you, were, when you said you actually created the Rap Olympics because of Eminem, because he couldn't get a deal and because of you knew how talented he was. Yes. Um, just before you kind of go into that, a lot of artists that I know go into this space where, listen, I am the most talented, the most creative. Nobody wants to mess with me. I don't know why. They're just hitting on me. But you had this individual that has now become one of the greatest rappers of all time, couldn't get a deal for only God knows what. You actually now went ahead and created an event to showcase him. How and why did you do that? And what did you see in him? That made and you I, want to put together and, the Run Olympics? And, yes, and it's funny because I still do that today. Not Rap Olympics, but I still figure out ways to get artists exposure other than just their music. And what I mean by that is with Eminem, um, this was back in 1997. And at that time, gangster rap was growing in the U.S. So the West Coast rap was coming up and the more lyrical rap was kind of taking a back seat. And I wanted to do Rap Olympics, not just to showcase Eminem, although that was the real reason. I wanted to showcase all of the lyrical rappers. And I saw people doing battles um, in different cities around the U.S., and th they were doing one-on-one -on -one battles, and I thought it would be cool to have teams battle teams. So I brought together, like, Wu-Tang had a team, um, uh, Razkaz had a team from the West Coast, um, all these different crews that were popular in hip-hop had um, teams, and I had a team as well. And my team included Eminem. It included a bunch of different rappers. And it was a battle amongst teams instead of just one-on-one -on -one going head-to-head. -head. Right. And that was different than what anybody had ever done. So I stood out in a lot of different ways with this event. Um, and consequently, I haven't done it since because it was so expensive and so much work to do, you know. But the great thing about it was we found something to do other than just market and promote the music of one artist. We were able to promote an entire genre of lyrical artists. All mm. of the blogs picked it up at the time. And back then, that's how, that's how you kind of catapulted yourself to success by the different um, – uh, media, the magazines picking it up and the radio stations picking it up and everybody was picking it up and talking about it and then you know here came this this white rapper that had been battling around the country and everybody got to see it you know you know um, in your face like how how incredible he was and even though he didn't win we came in second we didn't even win the event there was there was a crew that was even better. What happened was, as part of the prize for coming in second, they got to go on the Wake Up Show, which was um, a nighttime show in L.A. And on the show, they, they were catapulted to the next level because they had now won this event and people were trying to hear who they were and see why did they come in second mm. and, you know, hear all the behind the scenes dirt about what really went on at the event. And then in addition to Dr. Dre hearing Eminem rap on the wake up show in the audience of rap Olympics was Jimmy Iovine's nephew who got a demo tape because Eminem's team was there handing out, CDs that he had made of a P called The Infinite. So at every point in time, they were always active and they were thinking, you were thinking way ahead of time because you created an event to promote. In the event, you were still promoting, but still the work actually kind of carried on. Um, I think in today's industry, how can an artist, I think in the, in the industry we're in, um, funny enough, the same thing that you said, I actually did something similar about 10, 15 years ago. But I had a friend, the reason why I actually got into music, one of my friends used to be a rapper. And like, we obviously we're into hip hop and everything else. And we thought, hold on a second, we don't, we don't know no one. But what if we did a showcase where we brought in rappers, singers, poets, 
and he opened or he was the moderator for the showcase and we did it every single month we were able to pull in two three hundred of our friends in the course of a year times 12 that means he would have about three four thousand people that get a chance to see him and that actually you know so at times i think you have to think what can you do within your own limited resources i think out of the box for creating awareness about yourself and your brand how do you i think in today's industry i don't think enough artists do that collaborative mindset in let us go ahead and do something together because correct i mean i'm a hip-hop guy before i used to see Wu tango on the tour with um rockefeller i used to see all these different yep. crews put up an event go tour 52 states as a crew but it benefited from being exposed into um on a national wide level pulling your resources your fan bases and building on those relationships do you think that is something that is lacking in today's um, industry, or how do you think artists can do use that kind of same template in really piggybacking off each other to really get a better and bigger exposure? Especially if you have limited budgets or um, uh, upcoming artists. Yes. So if people collaborate, let's say, let's say you and I are both rappers, although that's very scary that I would be one. Yeah, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and let's say I have a fan base of 500 people. And you have a fan base of 500 people. So if we come together, we now have a fan base of 1,000 that we can reach. And just because we're coming together, we're going to reach even more people because of the whole compound interest idea. So our, our 1,000 fans are now talking to their friends, and maybe our number goes to 1,500 because we came together. Or maybe it goes to 3,000 because we came together. It, 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 it's just it's substantial the amount of people that we can reach when we come together. But you also have to be unique. Like for example, you mentioned doing showcases. If I were to do a showcase today in, in, um, in 2021, there's so many of them that I would not stand out. It would just be like me being another one of 30,000 rappers dropping music on a Friday on Spotify. It's, yeah. it's too much. So you have to think of something unique. And um, Action Bronson did a great thing. He was really the first person. He's probably not the first to do it, but he's the first person that I know to do it. And he started a YouTube TV show because he liked to cook. So mm -hmm. here's this guy who's a great rapper that's doing a YouTube show about cooking. <laughs> so now... <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like collaborating, right? Yeah. So, but he's doing it alone. He's got the fans come that are seeing him because they want to see him rap, and then he's got the fans that like the food. So now all of a sudden he's reaching double, triple, or quadruple the amount of people than if he were just rapping. So I do this with all of my clients now. I find out what's their... You need to expect about them, yeah. Yes, like what's yeah. special? Just like you and I, what's special about us is that we share our knowledge and we teach people. So we may have other interests, but people know us as like the teacher, you know? Yeah. And when they come in and they see us and hear us, then they learn, oh, you know, um, Wendy has other interests. She also helps build record labels and she helps. So what it's doing is it's catapulting us to the next level through however people come to us. And we don't care how they come into us. We just care that they come in and stay. And yeah. that's what artists do. So if you're an artist that's a, a gamer, you might want to set up... <laughs> and rap while you're playing. You know, be on... <laughs> Speak do, on it, Wendy. Please tell them. Tell them. Do, do what you do, but let people see that side of you. Don't, don't, you know, don't constantly do it. Don't drive them crazy with it. But do what you do. If you're somebody who, um, let again, let's say we're rappers, and again, it's scary that I would be. But <laughs> let's say that we're really good, you and I, about back to forth, you know, rapping. Why don't I make TikToks? of myself rapping, leaving spaces for other people. And then you can do the same thing on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And now we're attracting other artists to come to us and fill in those spaces on TikTok. So now we're, do we're starting a channel that's more than just us rapping. You're collaborating without even knowing you're collaborating. Exactly. Or being, 
and then you repost the best ones. So now you're showing people that you can rap and that you're great at rapping with other people and you're rapping with maybe a hundred different people over a period of a month. People are going to notice that. Eventually people will tune into that. And they will they will catch on and be like, oh, this is really cool. You know, if you've got a love for something like sports, why not start your own YouTube channel talking you. about, you know, let's say football is your is your is your favorite. And let's say you hate you hate one team but you love another. That could be really funny. Especially if you collaborate with somebody. Like let's say, let's say you have a favorite team and they happen to be the team I hate. We're going to be funny when we start talking about it, whether we want it or not, because we're just going to start joking on each other about how your team is whack and mine's great, or my team is whack and yours is great. Yeah. You see what you just said right there? I think when it comes to content creation, a lot of artists have a problem on creating consistent content. The thing is, always has to be about their music. But you see that same analogy you just gave? I've given that stuff to enough times. Because I've said, listen, if you're a Manchester United fan, which is football in the UK, if you support Arsenal or Man U or let's say the Lakers, why don't you get on on a YouTube channel or on a podcast with one of your other friends that is in the music industry yeah. and you have a, exactly and talk about the game that happens on a weekly basis? You're gonna have people that will come to you or love you just because you're a Manchester United fan. Yeah. And they will just support you because of that. You know? Yeah. So find the interest on what you love or what you're into. And speak about it at the beginning of your YouTube video. Your music can be playing in the background. It can be playing in the intro, in the outro. Like there's so many creative ways. Why don't you think outside of the box? And there's so many different. The fact that you said that, like literally, I've said that for hundred and one different times. But again, the artists themselves have to take action. You know, you can start a park. I mean, a friend of mine said just now. He said, Mike, what did, what did he say? He said like, um, Killer Mike became a social political commentator. You know. Um, so, yeah. My you know, so and Killer Mike and Trey the Truth, they have become the advocates for the underdog. Um, Stick from uh, Dead Prez is somebody that has always been outspoken. These have become our icons in the U.S. as more and more black men are dying at the hands of police brutality. These are the guys that stepped up and have gotten really outspoken. Willie D from the Ghetto Boys. You know, he got a, a, a very popular blog and a column in a, um, I want to say it's the Houston Chronicle. In, in one of the local papers, he's got a column where he talks about, um, you know, politics and things that really matter. So you don't, as a rapper, you don't have to just be a rapper. You can really stand up for other things and things, and don't be fake about it. Like, yeah. you know, I am funny, right? So I barely can say the words Arsenal and Manchester United. So if <laughs> I had a YouTube channel and tried to talk about these teams, I'd look like the biggest asshole in the world. Of course, it could be funny, but you've got to talk about things that you're really passionate about and things where you can really hold a discussion. Like, I'm, I'm not a cook. I cannot do a YouTube cooking show because it would be very apparent about 10 minutes in that I did not know what I was doing. So you've got to be funny. That could be funny when it fails on trying to cook or trying to learn how to cook. It could be something that could also work on the flip side. It could you know? be right. I could do a show where I bring people in to teach me how to cook. That could be very interesting to other people that don't know how to cook. It could also be very funny as I, you know, could barely boil water or whatever. It could be very funny and it could spread because it's it's fun and it's entertaining and it's charming. Awesome. No, I think you, you raised some another bunch of key points. Again, you guys, please, if you guys, you know, you know when it's dropping a lot of gems and all of knowledge, can I see a couple of heart emojis and I'll call a lot of thumbs up? Again, put a couple of questions in. I'm going to ask, ask your questions in a second. You've talked about building a brand. And I've always said, I have a saying that says the value is in the brand, literally. So in today's market, because you're not just a rapper now, now that you're just an artist or you're just a singer. Why? So you, you see the, the, the tip that you gave in regards to, if you talk about gaming, there's a possibility that a gaming company might see you as a rapper and sponsor your next event. Absolutely. Or cooking show might see you and think, you know what, oh, 
and sponsor you for your next promotion because they've seen what you've been doing over the space of time. How important is it in today's industry for artists to create brands and how can they start to make sure that their mindset, again, being deliberate and creating a brand that can outlive my musical career? It's all about the brand. You're the, the first day that you rap publicly, you're a brand. Your brand is what people say about you when you leave the room. So, for example, you mentioned Killer Mike. Killer Mike's brand is that he's a lyrical rapper who gives a shit about mm. people of color, right? He cares about social issues and black people. That's really his brand. So everybody has a brand, whether you know it or not, there is something that you're known for and that you stand for. And um, it could be positive or negative. I mean, um, Snoop Dogg, his brand is smoking weed. Wiz Khalifa, his brand is smoking weed. So whether that's legal or illegal or positive or negative, we could argue, but the point is that's the brand. So as an artist, you really need to show people the behind the scenes of who you are. Like, how did you grow up? Where did you come from? Where did you go to school? Who are your friends? Who's your family? You know, what do you believe in? What, what, gets, what makes you crazy? What gets you up in the morning, you know, are you, you? What inspires you? What motivates you and inspires you? Yes, exactly like you just said. Like people care about that. And that all adds to your brand. I call it living out loud. And it's hard for me because I'm older, right? Like I didn't grow up with social media. So all of this will always be until the day I die. But for for most people, that grew up in the 90s most of the, the the rappers today that grew up in the in the 90s and the 2000s like you guys were born with a phone in your hand almost so you should be living out loud on instagram and TikTok and snap and facebook you, your your social media should be popping compared to mine you know exactly. <laughs> i call it living out loud like share yourself with people don't 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 share stuff that you shouldn't and don't share stuff that might embarrass you completely. You know, I'm not saying, you know, to have sex on Instagram. I'm saying to just be yourself and let people see who you are and just let it fall where it falls. Awesome. No, thank you so very much for that. Um, a couple of questions. Somebody asked a question. Let me take one or two questions. He asks, Rockstar rock Tony asks, what is a good budget to kick off a successful independent music career? I hate that. I know, it's like, <laughs> how much money do you have? Like, literally, how long is a string? You know, but what would you advise, like, you know, because, I mean, I've heard and I've read for a major label to try and break um, an independent artist. I mean, this was one years ago. It can cost them anything close to a million, minimum a million, to just yeah. try and break them. And that was, I think I read that about five, six years ago, no, even now. Yes, and, and you know, it's so, this is such an expensive industry, and I hate to answer this question because it depresses so many people. So I'm going to depress you real quick, and then I'm going to tell you how to get past yeah. it. The yeah. real answer to that is, with my experience, with my connections in the U.S., I cannot break a rapper for less than $150,000. And then I charge 100000 for my services because I'm with you for the next couple of years to help you, you know, build your career. So the short answer to that is a quarter million dollars. You're competing with labels, though, that are spending millions. So your, your, your money has to be spent very, very frugally and very wisely you're going to end up calling in a lot of favors so now that you know that now that you know that a professional who does this can't do it less for that you know for less than 150 you have a choice you can discount Ed, and just go spend ten thousand and see if it blows you up and i hope that it does i hope i'm wrong but the smart people that are hearing this are like okay I've got a couple thousand dollars. I'm hearing the professionals say that it takes at least 150. Let me go put a business plan together. Let me go find some investors. Let me bring my friend 
family together. Let me find a way to do this so that it makes sense. And even if you don't believe what I'm saying and how much it, it costs, that's fine. Just go do the research. Go put together a list of everything you want to do to market and promote yourself. And then find out what it costs to do each thing and see what that total is. And then that's what you need in order to market and promote yourself for the next three months or six months or whatever. In the U.S., it takes anywhere from 11 to 18 months to break through. So you have to have enough money and be consistent to last at least two years. Wow. Wow. That's, and I think you, yeah, at that point, I think a lot of artists also, one thing I also say is the industry we're in is a marathon. It's not a 100-meter dash. Like, it's not a 100-meter dash. Like, I don't understand why. I think the mentality we have now is we live in a micro, microwavable um, society where everybody wants to put stuff in the microwave and have it ready in five seconds, in five minutes. I, you know, but, but then you can have a hit song in five minutes, but are you going to be able to have a successful career? There's a difference. Right. Having a successful career you, is different from having a you, hit song or a hit album. There's a huge difference between that. Huge. I have a client where we went gold this year independently. And that's amazing for an independent to be able to go gold, but we've only done it once. So now we're looking for that second song and financially he's okay, but he won't always be okay financially because the money's going to start to decline. And if he doesn't have more music that catches that same exact fan base, we're going to have a problem. So for that artist now, what would you say you spent in breaking that artist or how much do you think he spent before he was able to get out gold? And what are the, what would you say are the income streams? An artist, because a lot of artists just think my income stream alone is just in performing because I come from an industry where a lot of the African or African artists depend heavily on just live performances. Like that is, so what everything they do is just so that somebody can book them for a show and that's all they focus on. So right. I wouldn't really think it's a bad a model. We don't do no merchandising. We don't do a lot of other things that oh, should be done. To. Yeah, you have so, to. I'm going to tell yeah. you the ones that there's, there's hundreds of income streams, but I'm going to tell you the ones that I focus on for my clients because it's, mm -hmm. that's very realistic. So the number one way that money comes for rappers that I work with in the US is through shows. And that's even during COVID. And as scary as that is, my guys are all still doing small venue shows. You know, there are no Drake and Future and Rihanna tours. That doesn't exist. It would be too expensive to socially distance people and to test them, you know, as they come in for, for fever. But the smaller venues that hold 200 people to 500 people are alive and well in the Southeast of the United States. I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying that it is. So show money is the first way that money comes. Streaming income is the second way that money comes. The third way is through merchandise. We set up um, we set up websites for our artists immediately because I've learned over time that you may only have a hundred or two hundred fans, but maybe ten of them will buy T-shirts for twenty five dollars. Exactly. That's not. Bad. <laughs> you can then take that money and put it back into your career, and as you grow you're going to sell more and more merch. So merch is the next way that money comes. And then the last way that we focus on are synchronization fees. Mm. And that's where you pitch um, TV, film, games. You pitch them advertising agencies to put your mm. music into different advertisements. <clears throat> and you get paid for that. So those are the ways that we really focus on with what I do. But there's many more ways, like there's publishing money. There's um, before you even put music out, <clears throat> excuse me, in the U.S., you have to join a performing rights organization <laughs> as well as sound exchange so that they go and collect your um, radio money and your internet money, you know, internet radio station money and, and pay you. So that's another way that artists get paid. But that money takes so long to get to an artist. You could have a hit record in the U.S. 
and those checks don't come in for almost a year, you know, a year after you have the hit yeah. record. Okay, so what's this? Another key point, a lot of artists think, they think, oh, my song all of a sudden is blown up all over the radio, but from what you said and what I know, is it takes anything close to 8 to 12 months before you will see that, that money yeah. from yeah. actually having a hit record. But you'll get show money if your song is legitimate, legitimately right. blown up. And I say legitimately because some people here in the U.S. will take money because they have a lot of money and they'll hire a radio promoter and their song will look like it's blowing up, but they're not really getting shows. They're not really streaming. They're not really selling merchandise. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's bullshit. So the ones that are really blowing up where they're getting a reaction from the fans mm -hmm. They're making money from shows and merchandise long before their publishing income comes in. Awesome. No, thank you so very much for that. You brought back to, I had a, I had a consultancy session with an artist today. And all the sessions I've had with a couple of artists in the last couple of months, although they put out music and they're actively promoting it, it came to my attention that a lot of them are not even signing up to have their royalties collected. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking, hold on a second. You're putting out a record and you're promoting actively and if a record goes and gets to you know buzzes you're still not going to see no money because you've not done the groundwork what are what are what is the difference between the pro sound exchange and a music publisher because okay. i think a lot of people are confused a lot yeah. of people in my industry think once you signed on to a public performance um organization that is it they're the people that collect your money they don't right. realize that you have a publisher that also collects different revenues and also sound exchange. You do break down those three different tiers. I and let them know why that's so important. And and I'm going to break them down, but let me start by saying that this is an area where everybody watching this needs to to really research this because yeah. this is your money, and publishing is very <laughs> difficult to understand. And it's very easy. Like it took me six years to really understand publishing. And then just when I thought I understood, knew it, shit changed. And I realized I only knew a little bit. So I'm going to ask you guys to all go and study this. But having said that, a PRO is like ASCAP or BMI in the US. And in London is PRS. In London is PRS. Perfect. They go and they collect the. Uh, money that's made from the radio stations and from the clubs. So when your music is played live in a club or at a sporting event, you know, like Manchester United yeah. or, um, <laughs> or, or um, on in the radio. Venue, in a hotel or anything like that. Yeah, any place public, they will go and collect the fees and then split up that money between all <laughs> artists that had their music played so that's what a pro is for sound exchange does something similar but for the web so if it's an internet radio station or they collect part of pandora so any place where the music is playing but you don't have a choice of what's played so they don't collect money from spotify or apple your distributor collects that but they'll do like Wendy's internet radio station or Pandora or Sirius XM, like the, the internet. No interactive, no interactive streams that you can't control Correct. what they yeah. Correct. That sound exchange. And then the last one is your publishing income. And that is, you need to have a publishing company collect for you. Um, in For my clients, I use a company called Song Trust. They're owned yeah. by publishing which is a very strong big and reputable independent music publisher and they they publish like uh bruce springsteen and the beatles and a bunch of larger acts but they also do all of my clients because they'll go and collect money from overseas so if one of my clients is their music is played in russia or estonia or nigeria they will go and collect the money that is due that artist from those different um uh, uh territories yeah so you guys have heard just signing up to bmi to um to what's called to prs or to ascap is not enough you have to 
you know, you have the sound exchange, you've got your music publisher, your, uh, your music publisher, as well as your PRO. So again, we've just given you a foundation, but please go ahead and research them. Just Google is your friend. Don't be scared of Google. Oh, Google is Yes. <laughs> I tell you, like, even if you don't want to go through Song Trust as your administrator for publishing, they have so many free resources on their website. Just mm -hmm. go and download their ebook on publishing because it's going to teach you how this works. Whether you're their client or not, just go and get the information and learn how this works. Yeah, funny enough, I, I've actually done a couple of IG lives with somebody from SongTrust, a girl called Mandy, um, one of their country managers, and literally have actually had a couple of IG lives. And they're very, very helpful. Like, again, like you said, even if you don't sign up with them, but it's information. Again, you don't know what you don't know. You so don't have the information and, so you can make the decisions. And, and you don't have to be their customer. You don't have to be their client. They just want you to not get jerked. You know, they would love for you to be with them, but they realize that not everybody, they're not for everybody. And I think we all realize that, you know, we help the people we can help and we, you know, we let go the ones that we can't, but the knowledge and the information is out there. Just make sure it's coming from a legitimate and, and genuine source because there's a lot of misinformation out here as well there's a lot of people that i hear give advice all day every day and they're just fucking wrong like they got it so wrong or they're out here to just make money teaching but they don't really have any recent success in the music industry make sure the people you're learning from are doing this or have access to people that are doing this on a daily basis yeah no thank you so very much for that in, in regards to crime people have always had this um again this issue where should they wait i had a friend that like listen i'm willing to get a publishing deal so and they're thinking about instead of you just waiting for a publishing deal why are you losing that money why don't you at least go and sign up for of publishing administrator to make sure you're still collecting your revenue. So, like, you're waiting for the big publisher to come in, and again, with a publishing administrator, they don't own the rights to your song. They're just helping you collect revenue, and it's only for a limited amount of time. So, if a publisher wants to sign you, they're not going to have a problem waiting for two or three years or a year to kind of after your um, agreement is done. So, what is your opinion in regards to artists waiting to, to wait for a main publishing deal or? Waiting to, um, waiting to get a public to use a publishing administrator. What is the difference in both, and what is your opinion? I'm very biased, so let me let me warn you up front that you would also need to get the opinion of somebody that loves deals because I'm going to give you the anti deal. And what I need is a publishing deal is where someone comes in usually very early in your career. And they give money in exchange for a percentage of ownership of your publishing. So that could be, in most cases, 50%. So somebody may offer me, and not me personally, but you, <laughs> I'm not an artist, but somebody may mm. offer you $100,000 for half of your publishing. That means for the music that you make within that period of time, they're going to own half in perpetuity and they're mm. going to collect the money and give you half for the rest of your life in perpetuity, I like, <laughs> in perpetuity <forever>. yes forever <laughs> so i just feel like you're betting against yourself because when you take that upfront money it's going to be gone in a minute yeah. you know how we all spend money when we get it it's gone <laughs> but the reality that all of your biggest hit records may be owned in perpetuity forever and ever and ever by somebody else for such a little bit of money is insane to me. And I'm very anti-publishing deal. So I'm very pro admin deal. And what an administration mm. deal is, it's, it's where you do a deal with somebody, they collect your money for you, they take a percentage of what they collect, usually somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, but you retain a hundred percent ownership. So as your music blows up, 
and you start to make millions of dollars with your publishing, you're not losing half of your income to somebody else. You're collect you're giving a percentage to somebody that's doing a job for you. They're collecting money that you couldn't possibly collect yourself. So they're going to get your money, but they're they're only eating what they kill. So they're they're getting paid off of a percentage of money that they're bringing to you. And that makes perfect sense to me. But exactly. Money yeah. advance and lose your ownership. Get a fucking job. Like do something <laughs> else. There are other ways to make money than to allow somebody to prostitute you for your hard-earned artwork. And again, I am biased. So yep. Yep. definitely go listen to some publishers because they may have a different point of view. Mm -hmm. Just if you hear somebody say, Well, yeah. We have ownership, but we help you market yeah, cool. your music. Make sure you get that in writing because I have yet to see a publishing company help you. Usually they just sit back and take half to do nothing. That's been my. So, I, I think the point that you said that a lot of people think once you sign to a publishing company, they're just going to do all the work. So unless they're telling you they're going to put you in certain positions. For yeah. other opportunities, and you're signing that away because again, that hundred thousand would go just like that. You have expenses that will come and go, but then your your track could make um a million, but you now you now are only collecting fifty percent, and that person now owns that for life. But they've not done nothing besides. So why would you put yourself in that situation where somebody can just collect it for you and just like a percentage of what they collect, but you still own a hundred percent of that? Um, so that's a very valid point. Remember, I, I, my, this is kind of an old school example, but I remember one of my friends that worked at Bad Boy, which was the label that put out Notorious B.I.G. I remember him telling me that Biggie gave up half of his publishing to the label, to the label's publishing company in order to sign. And then right before his first album, Ready to Die, came out, he sold the other 50% of his publishing to the label because he needed money so badly. And my understanding is the label somewhere around three to four months to make back that 250,000 that they gave him. So he sold away the rights to that entire album and it was iconic and it was legendary. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it still streams and sells today and it's still making other people millionaires instead of you know, his family, which is really who should be eating off of the income from the public from that album. Yeah, exactly. Again, we're biased to the, towards that fact, but if you sign that agreement, understand what it is you're signing, that's why you need an entertainment lawyer to not, on the backside, complain, I didn't know I'm being cheated because, I mean, we also understand that, I guess, a lot of different artists are in different situations at different times in their lives. And so you're willing to maybe give up 50% just to take that money up front. There's nothing bad in that, but also understand what you might be giving up because you're taking that up front initially. So I think that's another um, very valid point. What would, you, what would you say kind of moving forward for artists today? Um, a lot of people have, have spoken about TikTok being the new radio and a thriller being the new radio. Is the radio still as important in breaking an artist in today's industry or should artists start to look at other forms like obviously online in regards to like a thriller or tiktok but from what i heard the top five or top top 10 records on the billboard charts are all tiktok hits or tick gone viral on tiktok so what is your opinion on that i i think that like like anything you've got to do the research and look at the data you know um and yes they're all viable ways to promote for my clients i use radio for the ones that have radio records i use tiktok for the ones that have tiktok music i use triller for the ones that have triller i use um dub smash for the ones that have dub smash type type videos you go where your where your audience is. So TikTok skews really young. So if I've got music where I want to reach people who are eight to twenty six, 
I go to TikTok. If I have music that skews a little bit older, I go to radio. So radio might skew from 26 to 55 years old. It's, it's a different demographic. You know, um, Triller reaches more men. Radio reaches more women. So I can't give you an answer just sitting here and telling you where you should go and market and promote because everybody's music is different. But what I can tell you is to figure out what your market is and then go where your audience is. So if the bulk of your audience is at SoundCloud or YouTube, you should be marketing at SoundCloud and YouTube. If the bulk of your audience is streaming you on Apple Music or Deezer or Tidal or Spotify, then you need to promote there. If the bulk of your audience is on TikTok or Snap or, or Facebook, you need to be there. You need to go wherever your audience is, you know, and it, it just has to make logical sense. And the most extreme example I can give you is if you're in a climate where there's a lot of ice and snow and you're trying to sell ice and snow, it's going to be a really hard sell. You're going to have to stand out and explain why your product is better than everybody else's or different than everybody else's. But you've got to be wherever your fans are consuming music. You can't just, I can't wake up and say, okay, I'm only going to put my artist music on SoundCloud because now I'm missing all the other ESP, the other platforms that exist where somebody can experience the music. But what I can say is when the music is everywhere and I'm looking at the research and data and we have yeah. access to all of that today and I see that the bulk of people are on YouTube, for example, consuming this artist's music, I'm going to make sure that I'm doing YouTube lives and I'm going to make sure that we're doing premieres of the video drops on YouTube mm -hmm. as we expand into other areas but wherever the bulk of the fans are is where i'm going to spend the bulk of the money okay again you're talking about your analytics look at your analytics understand your audience understand where they are and again those analytics are open to to everyone even from your instagram to your spotify to your apple look at the back end where are most of your streams coming from where are most of your fans coming from but once you understand who your audience are you can target and redirect most of your marketing Absolutely. because that, that's kind of where they are. And I'm, and I'm also going to say that, you know, I realize that artists are a little bit nervous about numbers and math. Most mm. artists are intimidated when we say research and data, but each platform has educational areas. Like you can go to TikTok studio mm. with TikTok and learn how to go viral and learn how to maximize your followers. YouTube has YouTube University. Facebook mm -hmm. has free Facebook class. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you can go to the platform and learn how to maximize your campaigns and your efforts. Why would you not do that? Just spend a week and really go deep into it and find out how to really maximize what you're doing. Yeah, thank you so very much for that. Um, I know we've been on here for a little bit. I don't know, a couple of questions I'm going to let you go. I know it's been a long day. Um, you guys, thank you so very much. Um, sorry, I'm Queen. Here. Yeah, Maximum, Camilla, um, I am KG. Thank you, guys. So listen, keep on, I want to say a lot of those hot emojis, a lot of those thumbs up. Again, if you have any questions, put it in the question box. I'm going to ask um, kind of Wendy. In my industry, we've come in, because I'm sure you know obviously about, about Afrobeats, or you've heard about Afrobeats and how it's kind of blowing up. Um, we've come to a place now where there's a lot of attention, just the way hip hop had a lot of attention back in the day. And that's why I actually wanted to interview you, because I think Afrobeats and the African music space is, is at a place where hip hop used to be, where we have this, this tremendous attention and a lot of labels, a lot of situations are coming in, trying to, you know, come in and take kind of a piece of the pie. You know, because obviously they can see an opportunity in that African or African market. Um, what I think we can also learn from how hip hop has become the number one music industry or one music earner in the world. What do you think as a growing or just about to be, I, I believe the industry is just about to be birth. 
what do you think we should be looking at as because a lot of labels have come in or some of our biggest artists have signed and left those labels what are the kind of agreements do you think we should be looking at when signing with international kind of labels or those kind of deals because they don't understand our markets so they're coming in from a perspective of yeah we know that there's numbers and artists are signing deals that make no sense to them they don't well just because it's a big label it's an international label they are putting themselves in a hole that they're thinking hmm i shouldn't have done this right. you know so what what advice could you give us that you knew from your hip hop days that we can take that okay when you're signing this kind of deals this are things that you should avoid or you should think of before signing on those dotted lines from yeah. an individual independent artist perspective also because we have a lot of independent small labels as well from those two perspectives what advice could you give them so that we can really learn and take notes from them? so africans right now are like the pretty girl at the club so yeah. when you go to the mm. club and you see a pretty girl what do you want to do? <laughs> you want to step up and have a, so, have a chat and, yeah. so all of a sudden, all these men are coming to the pretty girl mm -hmm. and they're trying to buy her a drink. And the more she says no, trying to, home. <laughs> yeah, trying to fuck her. <laughs> yeah. So the more that she says no, the more they want her because mm -hmm. there it becomes like, like uh, a challenge, right? So as an artist, I'm going to bring it back to the art form now, you know, mm -hmm the pretty girl at the club so as an artist the more you can hold off the more somebody's gonna want you if they mm. feel they can really make money with you you can't say no forever because they're gonna leave and go find the next pretty girl or the next artist mm. but you can say no long enough to get the type of deal you need what i've learned is the shorter the term the shorter amount of time mm -hmm. and the more you can get up front is the more beneficial and in the beginning i didn't think that i thought take mm -hmm. a little up front because you want to recoup but i've learned now that when somebody's into you for millions of dollars they're gonna find a way to get their money back if they're mm -hmm. only invested in you for a hundred thousand they can write that off that's that's a lunch budget mm -hmm. for, for yeah. money so the bigger the deal, the better chance you're going to have of them marketing and promoting you properly. Working in long term to make sure that they're able to recoup their money back and the yeah. shorter term. Is there anything else that you, you think we should... I like the shorter term perspective. You should okay. absolutely have an entertainment attorney who's done this regularly. Not, mm. not just an entertainment attorney that's done it once or twice. The more somebody negotiates and the more contracts they see and the more failure they see they, ooh, the ooh, better ooh. they become at spotting those, those the, so one of the reasons that i've gotten so great and i'm not a lawyer but one of the reasons i'm such a great negotiator is i've seen for decades where other people fail so when mm. i negotiate i make sure that the term isn't as long as this guy over here and we have an independent marketing budget because I learned this guy got jerked over there. So I've learned where people have failed and I'm able to put things into the contract so that that never happens to whoever I'm negotiating for. And an experienced entertainment attorney is going to have that same experience. They're going to know what to put in because they've seen where deals have gone wrong. So a seasoned, legitimate entertainment mm -hmm. attorney can really be helpful here. And understand that these guys usually get paid by the percentage. So there's an incentive for them to get you more money and to get a higher deal because they're probably getting paid 5% or 10% of whatever the money up front or the value of the deal is. So there's a little bit of incentive there for them. But I will tell you that you need to learn this industry. You need to study it. You can't just trust somebody else because take what I just said about co-publishing deals, right? Yeah. Every entertainment attorney in this industry is going to try to get their client a co-published deal because they get paid by percentage. So Ooh. if you do an admin deal, there is either no money up front or less money up front 
depending on how valuable you are. They're going to want to put you in a situation where you get the most money because they want to make 5% or 10% of that mm -hmm. advance that you're going to get from the publishing deal. Mm -hmm. Same with the manager. So they're mm -hmm. going to tell you that there's a benefit to doing these deals because of their own self mm -hmm. greed or their own self interest. I don't want to call it greed. It's in or interest greed, depending on oh. you know, how the <laughs> Say how it is, Wendy. Say how it is. <laughs> if you understand and you say to your entertainment attorney, well, I understand that they're offering me $250,000 and I understand that you want to get paid your $25,000 or whatever from doing that deal, but aren't I giving up half of everything for the next, you know, not only five years to them, but all the music that I make in that five year period, they get to collect 50% on for the rest of the life of the music. Isn't that correct? And when the lawyer says, well, yeah, the point is you were smart enough to ask that you got the answer. Now you know what you have to do. You have to decide, is it worth it to do that deal? Or what would an admin deal look like? And maybe the lawyer would only make $5,000 on that deal instead of $25,000 they're obviously going to want to do something where they make more money, but your money is not coming out of their pocket for the next 75 years of your life or the next 50 years of your life or however long that publishing deal is for. You see, listen, nothing but gems, you guys, knowledge. I hope you guys are taking notes because Wendy is dropping, to, to have an hour with Wendy, you guys will be paying a lot, a lot of money here. So we're giving you guys a lot of value. So please, Take a lot of notes. Um, somebody asked a question here, Wendy, when it comes to distributors. Um, he asked, any thoughts on United Masters versus City Baby, who I guess versus Distro Kid versus TuneCore? Do you have a preference that you like or me, you prefer? Yeah, to me, they're all the same. Exactly. Um, I know that TuneCore and Distro Kid will pay you 100% of your income and you pay to, to put your music on their platform. And I use both of them for my clients. So this is not being disrespectful to them. But I would like to know the, how good the deal, they're paying 100%, but is their 100% deal that they've negotiated with Spotify the same mm. as what 80% or 85% might be at United Masters or what 92% might be at STEM or what 80% might be at CD Baby. You have to look at what's best for your need. Mm -hmm. If you're yeah. somebody that has no access to any marketing services or um, somebody to help you purchase digital ads or do digital ads or influencer marketing, if you don't know who to call to help you do that, you may want a distributor that has access like a cd baby that has access to all of that but if you if you know where to go like i know where to go to do all that so for me what matters is the best split and who's collecting my money the best and what does their dashboard look like i need the yeah. research and yeah. the data that has more value to me than a couple of percentage points in income i need so to I where artists are selling is it more men than women what are their ages where do they live you what know industry they, is it the hip hop is it r and b is it afro beats which one works best for which for which space it's just it's just it's it's trial and error there is yeah. a one that works better it's individual taste let's just saying you know wendy what traits do i look like look for in a woman that i date or in a man that i date <laughs> it's different for everybody you may want somebody and your biggest requirement is that she has a fat ass. You know, for me, my biggest requirement is that a guy is intelligent and kind and funny. So we all have different needs. I can't just sit here and say, oh, you should call such and such distributor because they're the best. There is no the best. It's the best for you. Mm -hmm. And again, do the research, you know, talk to other artists. Who do they use? What are their, you know, what do they like? What do they not like? For me, I don't use DistroKid or TuneCore for all my clients because I can't pick up the phone and call anybody when I have a problem. I have happen. to support chat and I'm not, I'm, I'm busy. Yeah. I'm not going to wait for an answer. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, 
different needs for different people. Yet I have clients that use DistroKid and TuneCore. I'm happy with. And I think what, again, testing is a good thing to do. What I've done with a couple of clients is I've used different ones for different clients. So I've used the CDB, I've used the DistroKid, I've used the, the TuneCore, I've used, you know, um, I think what, what the other one is. So I've used all the, I think all four of them. And I think for me, I have the one that I think I prefer. Also, again, the dashboard and the, the, the usability of the back end is extremely important. How quick, when you put up the music, does it get distributed? How quick do you get, like, your reports kind of sent to you? When you go into it, does it look like a like a maze that you just don't even know what the information is? How you can, are, you, are you somebody that's going to get on the phone and speak to someone and you can't get a hold of no one? You know, so you're about to say when how long does it take to get paid there are some mm -hmm. distributors that pay every 30 days there are some distributors that pay quarterly if you're an independent label and you're getting paid quarterly it could kill your career you need to be paid as frequently as possible so maybe you're choosing your distributor you get less of a split but you're paid every 30 days and again it just comes down to what's important to you you know do you need somebody with a fat ass or do you need somebody intelligent mm -hmm. Or do you need somebody yep. that's both? She has a fat ass and she's intelligent. Yeah, everything. <laughs> I totally agree. Right, Wendy, um, somebody asked a question. Kuta De General, I actually wanted to ask her about this because this was one of the streams of income that you spoke about and sing deals. He was asking, how do I go about getting my music into films, commercials, and games? And funny enough, that's actually a space that I'm very, very interested in as well. Yeah. I'm actually trying to get into. So what is that process like? Because I think that's a very untapped, especially in my space. It, yeah, that's not something that we are even, even looking at. So how does an artist even prepare themselves? Or where do they even go to to get into it comes down to It comes down to relationships, like everything, mm -hmm. music, and you need to build them. So there are people whose job it is, and in TV and film, it's called music supervisors. Mm -hmm. They are the people that go out and find the music to put in to a certain scene at a TV show or when they're making a movie. And they love independence because we usually own the rights to our music and we can sign off very quickly. And these are people that are usually working on multiple projects at the same time. They're not looking for, like they don't need Jay-Z or Beyonce. They need a mood. So maybe it's a funny part so they need something upbeat or maybe it's a murder scene so they need something that's dark and has that that sad feel or that mm -hmm. gothic feel to it so they look for music based on feel more than they look for who the artist is and you build a relationship with music supervisors or they're a middleman that you can go to that will shop your music for you and if you do that, just be careful that they don't take ownership. Make sure it's split money. Don't give up ownership to get your music into a TV show or film or even a video game. So it's a little bit challenging now to start this because of COVID. People aren't in their offices the way they were a year ago, right? So unless you've already got the relationship with a music supervisor it's going to be hard to build that relationship right now today but once people start getting back to work um i've got a website called rap resources it's rap dash resources rap resources dot com it's rap okay. resources there's a dash between rap and resources and that website sells lists of gaming music supervisors film and tv mm -hmm supervisors, record labels, the middlemen that do the shopping, like uh, entertainment attorneys. I don't advise you to go there now. And I realize that I'm, I'm selling against myself. But <laughs> these lists... You look like I'm going to run day in a second. <laughs> I, I'm sure, you know. These lists have people's work phone numbers and their work emails. And mm -hmm. there's so much movement at different companies that these guys are um these guys are not in their offices they may have left one company because they got fired because covid all the money went down now they've moved to another platform another company so once covid is o not over but has you know heard 
immunity occurs from the vaccine and we're back to whatever the new normal is, that's when you can absolutely start figuring out who's where and pitching those people. Awesome. What do you think about music libraries? What are your thoughts on music libraries? I'm not familiar with them. I can't speak on, on that. I don't know enough okay. to be helpful. I'm sorry. No, okay. Um, I guess another way I think in being able to find music supervisors, LinkedIn. Go on to LinkedIn, Google music supervisors, or like now I'm, 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 on, I'm on Clubhouse heavy. So if you're in Clubhouse and if you get on Clubhouse, if you iPhone, and you kind of, in the search, once you put in music supervisors, anybody that has music supervisors in their bio, that will come up. Again, it's about building those relationships. I think that's a very key point. What, how important is it in building and maintaining relationships in music? Because I think a lot of the times, a lot of people get into relationships only when they need something. They don't foster or try to um, nurture those relationships. How important is it to um, feed those relationships over time because a relationship that you have five years ago might bring you the biggest deal come a couple of years later without you actually knowing. So how can artists do that and why is that very, very important in success in today's music? It's, it's, it's everything. Relationships are everything. Like when, when I get stuck and I'm having difficulty, I call my successful friends and say, mm. hey, how do I overcome this? Or how do I overcome that? And because I've built relationships, my friends are people that run successful record labels. So mm. I'm able to call the, um, the GM of Def Jam and say, hey, how do I do this? Or this is happening. What, what do you advise I do? It, it gives me access to information and mm -hmm. also it makes me accessible to people that are having difficulty or issues they can call me and say hey wendy i'm experiencing this on tiktok you know what's your experience and it it gives you a resource that that can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars that's the obvious one um the less obvious ones are relationships are when somebody knows your name and you've treated them with respect mm -hmm. when you start to succeed with something they're going to support you um best example i can give you is there's a woman that i know in music who just put out a book about how to make money in music and i posted her on my instagram yesterday i bought her book and i'm going to go in when i finish reading her book and write a review on Amazon about what I think of the book, you know, and I'm halfway through a book and it's quite good. And it cost me nine ninety nine, which is nothing in, you know, in the, in the scheme of things is what I would pay for, you know, two cups of coffee. Right. So I supported her and I, I discovered the fact that she wrote a book because I'm on her email list. We have a relationship. I know who she is. I've had lunch with her, but she's not somebody that I have lunch with every day. She's not within my inner circle, but I supported her because I know who she is. She's not some random person that wrote a book. You know, I, I have some sort of a relationship with her. And then the next time, I go to update my book or put out my book, I'm going to call her and I'm going to say to her, hey, what were your strengths and weaknesses in putting out your book? What did you find? Because I haven't put out a book since 2016. And this is 2021. In five years, everything changes. So yeah. our relationship... to her experience for whatever you're going to be doing later on because she's Absolutely. done it already. You know, someone put, someone put a message in here. I actually wanted to reply to this. He said, no relationship lasts forever. But I think that is the wrong way of looking at a relationship. Of course, me and you, I have friends that I grew up with that I don't speak to as much, but that doesn't mean in three, four, five years' time, I can't go in and you know ask them for something or have, because we don't speak or you're not that close knit. but it's how do you treat that person when you're in that relationship? What is your intention of that relationship? If you're thinking from just a selfish place where you only have a relationship for what you can get, what about what you can give? Because most of the time we go into relationship thinking, I want to take, take, take. But what are you right. giving to them? Right. You know, so I'm my, um, relationship doesn't mean interaction. Relationship means how somebody thinks about you when they hear your name. That's really what relationship is, right? So 
it, there may be people that I, I don't speak to regularly or that I haven't spoken to in 10 years, but they can pick up the phone and call me and have a conversation with me because we had a connection, had a relationship. So it doesn't have to, interaction doesn't have to last forever. That good sensibility has to. Let me give you the opposite and you'll understand exactly what I mean. Mm -hmm. There are people who, who email me or text me and ask me question after question after question after question, <laughs> and they bring nothing to me. They don't send me data. They don't send me research. They don't ask me, do I need anything? They just drink. I will put up with that. I will put up with that for probably five to ten questions, but after that, they get blocked. Because after a while, especially – if you're asking me questions that you could have Googled or you're asking me questions that are so basic that I can tell that you did no research, there's a difference between lazy and need um, and relationship. So you might get away with asking me a couple questions, but in, in a minute, you're going to be in my cell phone as douchebag or time. You don't, you, don't pick up. <laughs> you, get, you get no more interaction. So, you might have a deal on the table and you need to ask me a question about is this attorney legitimate and I'm not even seeing your questions or your texts because I've got you blocked and you don't even know it. So relationship is a two-way street. Networking is a two-way street. Mentoring is a two-way street. It's not, you're not put on this earth to just take from people. You need to give. There are people that um perfect example every other day right now i'm posting little snippets on my instagram right it's called inspiration 2021 it's free little snippets no. of what people can do to better their careers both in the music business and mentally right so i'm looking at the business side and the mental health side which i don't normally do and there's a guy named black lick i've never met him but he always reposts my um, video in his story and he does a little summary at the bottom. And he's been doing this for every series that I do. This guy can get anything he wants from me anytime, any day. He can wake mm -hmm. me up out of a dead sleep help him if I want. because yep. he has never asked me for shit. And he did this on his own. He did this out of love. I don't care how many people he has seeing it. That's not the point. Two people could see his post. The point is he's doing this because he believes in what I'm saying and he believes in me. That's relationship. And, and he's supporting you without you even asking or even asking for anything. And, and again, he's that, that shit. Yeah, and I think that's so very, very important because just that, I think a lot of people think they have to show you some kind of grand gesture. So that you can see that they've done this thing for you. No. They don't realize the little things that you do, but you notice yeah. it. And one thing I co I have come to understand is when you don't think people are watching, people are watching. Yeah. Even the little things that you do. Yeah. And I live by I live by this principle. It's good to be good. I know the industry that we're in, it's a people believe the music industry is based on everyone taking advantage of everyone and it's this sets pissed of everybody trying to get one over everybody else. But I know from where you come from and hopefully from where I come from, uh, we're trying to change that narrative in regards to, listen, we can add value and be people of integrity without trying to shit on you. And if money comes to us and you want to do business with us, that is choice is up to you. you know, but it's good to be good. Why do people think there's, like, you have to be the most despicable person to be the most successful person in the room? That is a false narrative that people just kind of put out. I don't I don't get it. What, I, why, why, why do you think that mindset, it's such one that is so especially in our industry. And I have a lot of parents that also don't want their kids or to go into, into this space because of that kind of energy. Yeah. How can we get around that? Because it's, I think, that, it's memory. I think we have a lot of mental health issues in the music industry. So I think there are a lot of people that just aren't well balanced human beings mm. in this industry. There's also a very low barrier to entry. And what I mean by that is if, if you want to play basketball professionally in the U.S., you have to graduate from college. You have to come up through a college basketball team. 
if you want to become a doctor, you have to go to medical school. Then you have to intern for two years. You got to do a residency for two more years. So there's, if you want to become a doctor, there's like 10 years of study that you have to go through. We don't have that in music. You can just go print a business card that says Wendy Day Records and tell people that you own a record label and now you're a fucking record label in the music industry, whether you know what you're doing or not. And it's an industry that's built on fame. So people don't really ask the important questions. They just care about who's famous and how they can get next to them. And again, that comes back to a mental health issue where you're driven not by what's right or wrong, but who's famous and who's not. And, you know, I, I live in the United States. We just went through a four year presidency with a guy who was elected because he was famous, <laughs> not because he was qualified for the job. And I'm, I, I'm not here to, to, to dispute politics. And I don't mean to disrespect him. I made more money in the past four years than I've made in my entire life combined. So I did not do badly with him as a president. But I realized that people didn't really call him out on things because he was famous. And they, they, people in our country and in the world are in love with fame. And for some reason, when you're famous, you get away with more than you don't. So... In the music industry, you can be a record label that's run by somebody that is notoriously known for not paying their artists, and new artists will sign to them all day, every day, even though it's known, even though yeah. you can go and research all the lawsuits of how people didn't get paid, and people will sign to them because they're known, they're famous, and they yep. dream so desperately that they're willing to do anything. I, again, I think, like you said, you are now people are now taking advantage of hope because people are hoping for something better. People are yeah. so that hope and that celebrity type. So it's now, you know. But again, it comes down to the mental. Uh, but again, I think that that's a definite discussion that needs to be had: the music industry and mental health. Because I think it's one that a lot of people. Even I've been a manager for years and just been a manager and working in the industry. You go through a lot of highs and lows, and there's nobody to tell you. You just have to figure your way through it and. The depression a lot of artists go through, not even just artists, you're looking at a lot of creatives from the managers to the producers, to people that work in that space. There's yep. a lot of, I've worked so hard for so many years, but nothing. Should I keep on going? Should I stop? Then you stop, then somebody else that you came after you all of a sudden blows up. Then how, what place does that put you in? What am I here for? The, there's a lot of that. So I think that's definitely an important one to have, but thank you for kind of highlighting that. Um, I wanted to ask you, what are three, I want to two, three, Can two I add more to that? questions. Can yeah, I go ahead. Add to that because this is yeah. really important. And this is something that I've been sharing for the past couple of years because I realized you were talking about how how much of a struggle it is. Like even yeah. as a manager, like behind the scenes, yeah. and this goes to everybody that's working in the music industry. It took me six years to start making money in music. It took me ten years before I could support myself without mm -hmm. without. So. I don't want people to think you come into music and you start working and within the first year you're, you're, you're rich. It it's, yeah. that's not it. And I promise you, I'm really good at what I do. And it took me 10 years till I could feed myself and my family doing what I do. Yeah. I it's think you, not you know, you miss a very really cool two key points. It's one is you making money. And the other is actually being able to sustain yourself and where music actually looks after you and your family yes. from it. So yes. have those two different perspectives. Um, again, it's, it's, it, I think also, I think there's also a financial education that needs to be done for a lot of creative and artists. So when you do start making money, you're making the right decision to create a legacy because you can be doing, I mean, I have artists that I know in my space that are doing four or five shows a week. They're getting paid 30, 40 grand. And, it's and they've done it for two years, but in four years' time, you don't have no money. But I know in off two shows, you could have put on deposit for a house that could have given you residual income for, the, for you and your kids that you don't have to worry about. So I think, again, that financial education is extremely important on knowing when you do start making money, how do you place that your income into places where, in case you don't have a hit for the next five years, you could still 
make have an income kind of coming in. Absolutely. It's so important. You know, one of one of my um, former clients bought a Range Rover and still lived in the projects. And he <laughs> couldn't even protect his vehicle. Like, he couldn't afford the insurance on it. He was parking it in front of his apartment in the projects. And, it, you know, eventually it just got, it got broken down into parts and disappeared. Mm -hmm. But the point is, if he had had financial literacy, he would realized that when that money started to come in, he could start investing in some real estate instead of buying that Range Rover. And then with the rental income, with the, he could have afforded something better than a Range Rover. He mm -hmm. could have moved out of the hood and he could have afforded insurance on his vehicle. Yes. <laughs> Literacy in this world, you know, we're yeah. consumers. Yeah, thank you so very much for that. Um, somebody asked a question. How do you, let's say, and we get this all the time, an artist, artist A does a collaboration with artist B, produced by, you know, person number C. They've got to split it. Again, could you explain to people why, why? Because I have, listen, the amount of people I speak to that have never done a split sheet and they have number one records, it's outstanding to me. Could you please tell them why a split sheet is so important? Yeah. And just in that example, Three, two artists, one featured artist and a producer. What should that, how do they work within that split sheet? What would that look like? So a split sheet is just an agreement on paper. It has your name, your address, your um, publishing company, if you have one. And it breaks down who owns what percentage of the song. So if you're a producer and you own 100% of your publishing, which you should then you're going to own 50% of that song. If you're a rapper and you own 100% of your publishing, which you should, you're going to own 50% of that song. So a split sheet is just an agreement where you fill it out, you put the percentage that you own, and then you sign it very quickly. And you do this before you even leave the studio. And it's especially important because if that song gets traction and grows less, blows up, people get selective memory about who <laughs> like selective memory, I like that. All of a sudden you've got people saying, Well, I was in that stu in the studio that day and I wrote the hook. Okay, great. Pull the split sheet. Let's see who wrote the hook. Because if you wrote the hook, you're gonna own twelve point five percent of that song on the split sheet. And if you're not on the split sheet and it goes to court, you're going to lose whether you legitimately participated or not. So you've got to be on that split sheet. And then once the split sheet is done, the split sheet is done right there in the studio. Once that, once that is done, then that is sent to the lawyer and the entertainment attorney puts together the agreement that gives the artist the right to use that track or gives the artist the right to use your hook or gives the producer the right to put somebody's lyrics on their track. It, it specifies exactly who did what, who gets paid what, and what happens if people aren't, aren't paid properly. Like, what is your recourse? So many people have come to me down the road and said, um, yo, I put out that song in the 90s and it went multi-platinum, but I never got paid. Well, what does the contract say? Because the contract tells you how long you have to get sued, to sue, how long you um, can go uh, get your royalties for. Like, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, um, complain about not receiving royalties in about two years, most contracts say you don't have the right to them. So you can't wait four years and say, oh my God, I never got paid because the judge is going to say, well, in the contract, you were supposed to complain within two years and you didn't. That's why you need an entertainment lawyer to look through your agreements again. Everything that might look like it makes sense in black and white to a lawyer that has been doing this for a couple of times, they will be able to pick out those little points. So I think exactly. that was such a, such a very important point. Um, Yay! Um, 
Ooh, look, Davy J's in the room. Woohoo! <laughs> Davy J, how you guys doing? So, um, you guys have, I'm going to just ask many three more questions and we'll call it a day. She's here close to two hours. Thank you so very much. You guys, you guys are doing something with Jen. Are you recording this? No, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it for sure. I'm going to save it for sure and I'll send it to you. Thank um, you. Thank you guys so much. I'm getting text messages from people like on my phone asking me, yo, this is awesome. Can you save it? <laughs> Yeah, and I appreciate that for sure. What in, what would you say are the three principles that you live by, that you think if artists live by those principles, then they have a better chance at making an industry? I think we all as individuals have different things that we want to live by. Uh, for example, I refuse to screw somebody else over just to try and get a problem. Like, that is not me. Like, I don't believe whatever is going to come to me is going to come to me. So what are three principles that you think you live by or artists should try to incorporate. I mean, your principles are obviously everybody has their thing and that could help them in, you know, on this road to success. I'm going to give you the ones that I live by because I think that it's good for any industry, especially for artists. Always do what's right. Don't take, you know, like don't take advantage of anybody. Don't jerk anybody. Do what's right. Educate yourself. Learn as much as you can about whatever you're doing. So if I were in the tech space, I would learn as much about tech as I could. If I wanted to play basketball for a living, I would learn as much as I can about basketball. Learn as much as you can about the industry. And then the third one, gee, I want to give you like 50. Um, no, give me five. No, give me five. Give me five. Give me five. I can do, three. I can do three. So um, be passionate about what you do. If mm. is not your calling and you're doing this because you just want to make money, you're going to be really disappointed because it takes a long time as we just discussed it takes a long time for the money to really start to come and it's a lot of work for free before you can really make a shit ton of money in this and if you're passionate that passion is what's going to keep you going like there's never been a time where somebody didn't pay me for my work and I said oh I'm just going to quit you know the passion is what keeps me going. So it doesn't allow, if somebody hurts my feelings or somebody tells me, Wendy, I hate you, you suck, that doesn't stop me because I'm not driven by needing to be liked. I'm not driven by, by, by needing to be famous. I'm driven by needing to help people. So as long as I'm helping people, I'm happy. And the day that I can no longer help people, I'll go do something else because that's what drives me. I so agree. For artists, yeah. it's be a good human being. Please, please. Learn as much as you can about the industry yeah. and, and your art form and be passionate about what you do. Exactly. And also, I think you also said a very key point. When... When I was 16, I knew that I couldn't sing or rap to save my life. Neither was I interested in making beats, but I knew I always wanted to help artists to be successful. So I run a management promotional company called Spotlight because I wanted to help people be in the spotlight. That is why my name is still Spotlight. My company is called Spotlight Management Consultancy. Um, I think a lot of people fail to realize that there are other roles within the music industry that you can do without being the person in front. And you can even make more money than the person that actually sings on the street. You understand? You can be a songwriter, you can be a producer, you will get paid first before the artist gets paid. So you can be a PR person, you can be a great um, lawyer, you can be somebody that works on radio, you can be an OAP. Yes. You know? You so, don't have to always be in front of the camera. Um, yeah. And I'm even going to take it a step further and tell you that I'm hugely uncomfortable being in front of the camera. I would much rather be behind the scenes in anything that I do. You know, and as an artist, if your music is not loved by the masses, make it for yourself and find a different income stream and a different avenue to be of value in the music industry. The music industry has a ton of jobs. So yeah. you might not ever become Drake or Rihanna, but you can be you and you can be the best you possible. And that may be as a publicist or a teacher or a consultant or a marketing person or an accountant or a lawyer. There's so many different things that you can do in music that are even more fun than being in front of the camera. I agree. I agree. Um, 
what three books would you say every artist need to read? It can be including your book. Uh, it could be a musical. It could be a book about the music industry. It could be something about mindset. What three books would you advise that, listen, these three books can help you really get your mind right. What three books would you advise every so, two artist to go and pick up? I would, and it's funny, I would not include my book in that. Um, maybe mm -hmm. if we expanded it to the top five or ten, I would. Top five. Top five book. I want your book to be number one. I, I, Please. I, I love you for that, yeah. but it, it's never going to be because there's so much you have to learn before yeah. you how to get a record deal, right? My book is about how to get a record deal. And really it's about how you want to stay independent. When you read it, it's really not about how to get a record deal. So there's so much you have to learn. So number one, Donald Passman, everything you want to know about the music business. I think that's a great, great, great book. Number two, number two would be, um, uh, um, I forget the name of the exact book, but it has the word focus in it. It's by Jack Canfield, C-A-N-F-I-E-L-D. I think it's called The Power of Focus. And oh, you, power of focus. I, I read this book every nine months to a year. Like I read it all the time. I, I've never read it just once. I, it's, I've got it on a hardback. I've got it on my phone. I've got it on Kindle. I've got it everywhere that I consume books. I have this book. And every time there's a new edition, I go and I buy the new edition. But it teaches you the power of focus, of honing in on something and become really good at one thing and then two things and then three things. Because if you try to do three things at once, you're, you're divesting your energy, your resources, your money, and you're going to be mediocre at all three. But you can focus. You can do everything you want to do. You just have to be a sniper, not a shotgun. You have to focus. Complete it, focus on the next thing, complete it, focus on the next thing. Um, and then the third book, this is a little bit of a weird one, but it's Robert Greene's um, book on power. Okay. And the reason I'm putting power in my list is because the music industry is very Machiavellian, right? It's There's mm. a lot of snakes, there's a lot of fuck shit, there's a lot of evil people doing bad things right and to take advantage of you and for those of us who are good human beings and we don't really see how people can get over on us so we yep. get taken advantage of this book teaches you the basic principles of humanity and mm. not only shows you like how somebody could take advantage of you, but how you can flip it and protect yourself. And when I read the 48 Laws of Power, it mm -hmm. came out in 1998. I remember where I was sitting when I finished that book. That's how powerful the 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene was for me. It taught me so much. Sorry, I have, I'm having trouble hearing I have given that book to more people than any other book out there. Yeah, and it's still relevant now. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. More? Okay. So, yeah, please. If you're going to build a business, you see my books all have different, different um, to assets to them, right? So, there's a book by Jim Collins called Good to Great. And Good to, Good to great, great teaches you how to build a successful company and a successful mm -hmm. brand, it teaches you how to set big goals and then how to achieve those goals. And goal setting and goal achievement is how you succeed in life. So Good to Great is an amazing book. And then my fifth book would be whatever book I'm reading at the time. And mm -hmm. I read a lot. I used to read a book a week, but then I got busy and I kind of backed off of that. But that's mm -hmm. been a great thing for me with COVID. I started reading again. Mm -hmm. So um, right now I'm reading... Um, um, innovation stack, I think it's called, and it's really a great book. It's the guy who invented Square. You know, Square, mm. the thing that you plug into your phone so that when somebody buys merch at a show, you can oh, yeah. scan the credit card right there on the spot. Well, mm. this book is by him, and he talks about how when he built Square, Amazon tried to step in and build their own individual payment. Right 
disruptor and he built he beat amazon like he is one wow. that amazon could not squash and the reason that book is important not because it's just disrupting finance and it's talking about how we can like you know sell more merch at our shows but it talks about how the little guy can win over the big guy and sometimes as independent artists we look at the major labels and we look at the drakes and the rihannas and we get very discouraged and here's this book that's teaching us innovation stack and here's this book that's teaching us exactly how to win the david and goliath fight to be more mm. david than goliath did i say that wow. right yes. yes you did yes. and what is your book the title of just slip and what is your book oh my um, book is how to get a record deal how to get a record deal because a friend, I haven't read it yet, but a friend of mine, Taye, who is Yemi Alade's manager, um, it's like that book helps set his mind right in. And right now, Yemi is one of the most successful artists out of Africa. Like she's done stuff for the UN. So that, you know, he wanted to say thank, said I should tell you thank you for, uh, for that book because that really helped him kind of really set himself up. And now they're independent, but they're doing tremendous and outstanding stuff in, in Africa. I'll, one book, I'll, I have a bunch of books, but I read a lot. The one book that I like, that I read a lot, is The Principles and Power of Vision by Morris, by um, Mon, 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 Monroe. The, the, the Principles and Power of Vision. Being able to put your vision and say, listen, this is what I want to do. And being able to cast that. And because everything starts with the vision you, you, you put ahead of you, even as an artist or as a creative. Unless you have that vision for what you're trying to accomplish, then, you know, you can't manifest nothing. Um, across so thank you that that is those are your awesome set of books i'm going to make sure i'm, a, I'm an audible person now so I, I i listen to i pay for audible and i think yeah. I've, read, I've listened to yeah. more books in the last year than i have in the last 10 years because Me too. Of audible. yeah I'm, I'm going to ask you this question if you were not doing music what would you be doing if wendy day wasn't doing music what would it be well, I make a lot of money in real estate. So, you know, I realized probably real estate full time. I realized, but I'm not passionate about it. I realized very early on in my career that I was never going to become very wealthy in music because I'm not willing to do the one thing you have to do in order to be wealthy, and that's take ownership of somebody else's art form, like, you know, like do publishing deals. Uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the take side so i learned how to flip houses mm -hmm. in 2003 to feed myself and it enabled me to make money outside of music so that i wouldn't have to just take on clients that weren't talented but had money mm -hmm. in order to feed myself it enabled me mm -hmm. to just really work the projects that i felt i could bring value to you know and i guess if i weren't doing this I would probably be doing that, but I'm not passionate about it. So maybe I would be in the tech world and still okay. flipping houses to make money like I do in music. Like when I'm not making money from clients, I'm doing real estate. Like right now I'm building a co-working space and that's going to offset my income from building um, Artist Centric, which is the incubator that I'm in the yeah. process. The building for rappers so maybe i'd be doing something in tech okay. because I'm okay. a geek and i love to okay interesting if you're geeky I, then tech would be your space i i don't know i i, I never, can't imagine you never thought about it <laughs> okay what a great, great question talk. though yeah i i think our time because we're so engrossed and passionate about what we're doing, we're doing now like if it was a different life what would that be i've got another better question for you what would you tell your 10 years old self if you could speak to your 10 years old self now what advice would you give your 10 years old self i would say don't be afraid mm -hmm. when i was young i was afraid i was afraid to speak my mind if somebody hurt my feelings i was afraid to tell them that they hurt my feelings i would just pretend like they didn't mm -hmm. i was just always afraid i was afraid of my mom like disappointing her you know mm. i was afraid of in relationships i was afraid of saying what i do is just as important as what my partner 
does. You know, sometimes I would let the guy's business be more valuable than you want to value you. Yes. So I would, if I could go back in time, I would tell myself to not be afraid of that shit and to speak my mind. And I learned it pretty quickly. You know, I remember I was 30 years old when I started Rap Coalition. And most of the people in the music industry at that time, like Jay-Z and KRS-One and uh, Cypress Hill and Naughty by Nature, they were all 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. They were all much younger than me. And I remember thinking, oh my God, if if I had just started living my dream 10 years before, where would I be now, you know? And while I have no regrets, I'm not somebody that ever says woulda, shoulda, coulda. Woulda, woulda, yep. I'm very happy. Like, I'm very happy where I am. I'm very happy. If I had it to do all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. And that is true. Yeah. I would tell myself to not feel the fear. I wouldn't do anything differently because I love who I am today and I love where I am today. But the stress and the anxiety that being afraid of what people thought, like when I started my company, even my family, they were like, what are you doing? You're giving up a job where you make, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year to make nothing. Like, what the fuck are you doing? You know? And I was very, even though I didn't listen, I was very impacted by that. Like it made me. Living with that fear. It, it affects you, whether you like it or not the way I do now. Like now yeah. I'm not afraid to shine. I'm not afraid to say I did this, I did that. It still makes me a little uncomfortable yeah. because I'm not somebody that's braggadocious, but I'm no longer afraid to stand up for myself. And I yeah. think that that's really important. I think that takes me to a quote that you actually said, uh, which actually your motto, which is which you said in a, that I kind of picked out online said everything you want in is on the outside of fear. What today? Out of fear. Yeah, everything that you want is on the outside of fear. Again, even again, working in the industry, being a manager, I've always had that. Oh, what if my artists leave me? What if I don't succeed? What if I don't get them? Like, like now, like I'm gonna be the best that I can be and do the best that I can because I know I'm gonna give you all I can. So that whatever happens is out of my control. I believe in controlling what you can and what you can't control. Don't bother about it because, and also, unless you have a time machine to go back in time, you can never redo what you did because you will never know. So just be more, you know, eh? unless you own the, what's it called, the to Todolian or whatever they call it. I used, the future, I used to be afraid of people leaving me because I felt like it was them saying I wasn't good enough. Good. Thank and you. Yeah. This is mm -hmm. just, um, I'm giving you advice from experience, right? This mm -hmm. is just, yeah. And this is going to be everyone who's ever left me has gone with somebody that's lesser than me, meaning yep. they're not as powerful. They're not as experienced. They're not as good. And what I realized was people aren't leaving me because I'm not good enough. They're leaving me because I'm not giving them the attention that they feel deserve. So, Artists have left me and then, like when I was managing, artists left me for a manager that wasn't like one. You invested in them, like you were invested in them. There all day, every day. So mm -hmm. they chose to have a homeboy or a homegirl over success. Not mm -hmm. to say people weren't successful, but they weren't as successful as they could have been. No one ever left me and 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 went up. And that just blows my mind because if I'm going to leave somebody, I'm going to leave them so that Scooter Braun can manage me or or Troy Carter can manage me. I'm not going to leave somebody so that somebody that nobody's ever heard of could manage me. And that just when I realized that it just changed everything for me. And now I'm not afraid of them leaving because if their needs aren't getting met, I want them to move on because it means they weren't right for me anyway. Exactly. I, I think that I'm mindset shift, girl. Yeah, that mindset shift puts okay. you in a better place. And you also, because at the end of the day, what you want is 
success for the person they're looking after and they feel that they can go somewhere else. But again, because we're doing more in a working relationship, don't mean we have to be enemies. And that's why it goes back to being able to maintain those relationships. You know, um, I'm going to ask you my final question. Thank you so very much for the time that you spent with me. I'm so happy. But to this one, um, I can't tell you how much we have. This has been two hours. We've literally been here for two hours. Oh, we literally. have? Yeah, two hours. We've literally been here for two hours. So this question is, if all the books that you've, all the posts that you've put out on Instagram, the book that you've read, the interviews that you've given, the um, talks that you've spoken on, um, if everything disappears and you can only give one advice, one, one thing that you want to be remembered for, what would that one thing be? So nobody can find anything about when the day, like everything that you said has just disappeared. But aliens come 100 years from now and there's just one thing that you can be remembered for. What do you want that one That's thing to be? So easy. That's the easiest question you've ever asked me. That one thing is learn the business that you're in. Learn as much mm -hmm. as you can about the music industry. Because even if I'm not here to tell you, and at some point I won't be, at some point, <laughs> I'm going to die. It's going to evolve. So you want to, yeah. Mm. To learn as much as they can about whatever industry they're in, but especially if you're in the music industry, because you cannot travel through this industry without knowing it, understanding it, knowing who the players are, knowing who's good, knowing who's bad. You have to learn the music industry. And when you think you know it, you don't. Keep doing research. Keep yeah. doing it's changing constantly every six months i don't do today in marketing and promotion i don't do the same things today that i did six months ago that's yeah. how fast it changes awesome thank you so Wendy. thank you so very much hopefully before this year is done i'm going to get you out to nigeria and get you out to africa because i think they need to have the mindset that you that you can you bring and i know the heart that you have for the industry and for artists and for creative, it's from a pure place. You really Thank want them to win and you really want them to be equipped. And for that, I can't tell you how much you've helped set a lot of us that are trying to do the same. You've helped set those ladders and you're trying to kind of not just emulate what you've kind of done and make sure that we're consistently giving value and really helping those creative be all they can be. So for that, thank you for all you do, not just for the rap industry, but for the music industry as a whole. Um, and please never stop doing you. And I hope we can all, in a way, give you your flowers while you're here. I appreciate you. And just tell you how much we thank you so very much. Thank so, you to you and thank you to your followers. I, I want to shout out the person that listed the books in the feed. Yeah, you did. Who that was. But that person is going to win. Because that yeah, exactly. he said and put it into the comments for everybody. Okay. And that is a winner. Yeah, that Razim Jason. Razim, Jason, that was the guy that did it, you know? So, well it. done. You guys, keep on mind. Give um, a lot of um, heart emojis, a lot of thumbs up. Thank you guys for spending the last two hours with us again. I'm going to save this on, on IG Live. I'm also going to send it to you so that you could, you so that you also have it. It was the Learn to Earn series. You learn so that you can earn, but also, like we've all said, I think the main thing is it's good to be good. Like, there's nothing wrong with being good. good. Yes, it just <laughs> feels good. Hey! You feel better, you make, you make money, and it's good to be good because you can make all the money you can, but you can feel like shit and you can want to kill yourself, unfortunately. Because again, we know a lot of people that are in that space. You make all the money that you can, but later on, you're depressed. And so be good, have a clean out as much as you can. And um, you guys have an awesome evening. Thank you so very much, Wendy, for staying with us for so long. And you guys take care, stay spotlight. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for everything. Bye. Thank you, Wendy. Bye now.